Welcome, my name's Anthony Haynes. I'm Creative Director at Frontinus Limited and I'm delighted to say that today I'm joined by Hannah Lee, who is a doctoral researcher at Heriot Watt University. So greetings to you, Hannah. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, so my name is Hannah Lee. I'm a third year PhD student at Heriot Watt University studying marine biology. And could you tell me, first of all, thank you for that, could just tell me a little bit more about what does this research entail? What, 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 what are you actually up to? Of course. So my research focus is blue carbon, which is the carbon that's stored in our oceans and how shellfish such as oysters and mussels enhance the connection between the sea and the seabed. So this is to do with how they feed and also how they grow both their shells and their body. My main research goal of my PhD, which I'm now starting to get towards the end of, um, is to look at all these different routes of carbon deposition. So sediment and the shell, and also routes of release. So how carbon leaves the seabed and how in a shellfish bed, what should take away that release, how much carbon remains and that's right. carbon stabilization or net carbon capture. And you've, you've been doing your research um, as part of a Dornoch uh, environmental project and you are uh, in partnership with Glenmorangie Whiskey. So I know you've told me previously that's, that's turned out to be a very good um, partnership to have. So I was wondering, could you just tell me a bit more about how that works? Yes, so I'm part of the Dornoch Environmental Enhancement Project. Um, that's a research team that's a partnership between the Glen Morangie Whiskey Company, Harriet Watt University and the Marine Conservation Society. So I'm one of a number of PhD students within the group and it's an initiative to restore the native oyster to the Dornoch Firth which is on the northeast coast of Scotland in Tain. What the partnership is is we're the science base of it and then for Glen Morangie it's about restoring the oyster to enhance that beautiful natural environment where the mm. distillery is based in Tain. Mm. Excellent and it, it, I mean the name the brand Glen Morangie is very well known already but I think, yeah. I think one thing I've learned from you is it's more than just a matter of putting whiskey into bottles. Oh for sure and it's a yeah. great project to be a part of. <laughs> yeah excellent. Um, so you have to do research but then you also have to communicate it and one thing I've discovered from working with Harriet Watt over the years is that um, uh, I think the university is rather innovative and energetic about how it communicates research. So how have you gone about trying to communicate your work? Um, many different ways actually. I've got a little list. <laughs> right, do, um, do, 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 do go through them, yes. So I think primarily it's probably conferences, which I think for a lot of academics is certainly one of the main ways that talks and research is communicated, but not just in giving talks, but also through attendance and actually just networking and talking to people, which I might go into a little bit moment. I've been to quite a few conferences since starting my PhD in 2018 mm. and I've delivered talks both here in the UK but also overseas um, in Europe so quite international conferences as well. Some of them have been more specific audiences so either blue carbon or specifically oyster based mm -hmm. and some have been more general audiences for example uh, the European Marine Biology Symposium or the Mass Annual Science Meeting, which is the Marine Alliance for Science and Technology in Scotland. Um, so that's a network across the whole of Scotland of different institutes and every year there right. is a meeting. Um, obviously in person previously, uh, but this year I have taken part in three webinars also. Mm -hmm. um, so one was for policy, uh, that was to do with various uh, parts of policy and having policymakers attend. Uh, the other, again, was a more general audience, that was for masks, and the last one was a more specific oystery audience. And other than those talks, I've also done student talks. Um, okay. So quite a, that's definitely the, the, the start of it, is uh, quite a few talks. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And uh, what about uh, mo moving on beyond talks, what, what other types of things have you done? Uh, beyond that point, uh, definitely I think videos and imagery have been a really big part of my PhD. Yeah. Um, videos specifically, being part of DEEP, so the Dornock Environmental Enhancement Project, we have a number of media pieces and these tend to be updates either on individual researchers' projects or on the project as a whole. Um, so there's a number of videos that are already published and available 
the, are the start of the project, uh, when the first oysters went in, and the first bit of shell going in as well. Um, so I was quite heavily involved with that one at the start of my PhD. And with those videos as well, they're not just through Glen Murrungee, but I'm also part of the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum. So right. we have videos with Marine Scotland uh, that are accompanied by a short blog about our research and a profile of us as a researcher. Um, so there's a number of bits of video footage that I've done and they're always great at the end of a conference. Uh, we mm -hmm. tend to play them or my supervisor will play them and they're a really good talking point because people either come up to you and say, oh, that video you played was great or weren't you just in that? And it gets that <laughs> all rolling. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the first time one was played, it's like, oh, there you are. <laughs> yes. Um, and drone footage as well. People love drone footage. Yes. Because um, I have a drone for my project. So sometimes I'll always get some nice images of the Scottish coastline, which is just stunning. Um, and play that at the end of a mm. conference book. And it's just a nice close and also a nice talking point. Yeah, excellent. And I, I know from previous discussion that you've also made use of still photographs. And I'm interested in that because I think people often overlook the value of still photographs and see them as a bit of a sort of, you know, outdated technology, which is not what I think at all. So how have you, how have you gone about using that? I completely agree with what you just said there. Um, one of the things of like photos is for features or websites, having photographs of yourself and also your, what you're doing as research is so valuable. And that's one of yeah. the things I'm really becoming quite conscious of at the moment because I tend to take a lot of photos of other people but not always have photos of me. Mm. I don't get them straight off people when they take them. So it's always kind of having a file is one of the things that I was given the tip. Um, have a file that's your media file that has stills or videos and keeping that updated because when yes. you're going to have someone wants to feature you or you approach someone about a feature the last of pictures are something you don't have any <laughs> um, yes. so yeah i take hundreds of photos and not just of the sunrise <laughs> <laughs> but they yes. are very nice as well i think lots of people love my sunrise photos <laughs> <which is always laughs> <good. laughs> and you talk about the advice you were given there and i think that sort of quite naturally to the next question i was going to ask you which is um other career, early career researchers uh, if they're giving some thought to how they should try and communicate their research and what's worth doing and maybe what's not worth doing for that matter, what, what sort of advice would you give to them based on your experience? Um, quite a few things, I think. Uh, as I've already said, conferences, open days, uh, stuff like that, but they come under networking. Uh, mm -hmm. Keep networking. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it might be that the people that you're networking with at that moment in time aren't completely intrinsically related to the piece of work you're working on, but they may know someone, <laughs> they know other yes. people, or they may in the future um, have quite a relevant role in you meeting other people or something to do with themselves and their own research. Um, so that's one of my big things is networking, um, I think is really important, other than photographs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, another one would be probably find your message. Uh, so like a PhD in a tweet, as it were, uh, quite early on uh, when I started my PhD. That's one of the things that it took a little time to refine was what is what am I looking at in a sentence in like 10 words? <laughs> um, because what I found was if you can't say it succinctly, you'll probably confuse both yourself and the person you're talking to. Yes. Um, so it's really great finding your PhD in a tweet. And if you can summarize a whole three and a half years in a tweet, <laughs> it puts it across really simply. Yes. And I should say, I mean, I, I too am very keen on networking. It's played a big part of my career. I think one of the problems is that people often have negative associations with the word networking and they associate it with sort of salespeople working the room <laughs> and manipulating people. I don't know about you. That's not, not how I've experienced the phenomenon of networking in research terms. No, I think in general, um, I'm quite a chatty person, <laughs> uh, as you're probably finding. Um, so, I think it's just about being friendly and also people will remember um, that you were chatting and you were friendly and it might be that you talk about something that's really relevant to wherever you are or the talk you are at or it might be that you talk about something that's just an interest um, mm. and then you'll see those people again potentially at other conferences and that means you also have that connection there of them introducing you to someone else um, and that's how I've met again a few people is I seen someone I know very well and they've then introduced me to the, whoever they're talking to at the time while drinking coffee. Yes. Um, so yes. I, I find those moments really valuable and those conversations. Yeah. 
And it seems to me one, one implication or well, one inference I'm drawing from this is uh, it's very easy when you're a PhD student to kind of almost develop tunnel vision and just kind of get obsessed with your own work. And it feels to me like you're looking kind of upwards and outwards a lot and seeing what's available. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, I, I think I'm always trying to look for opportunities, um, certainly of what, what might be coming up, um, what I can balance with the time that I have. Um, that is more than just doing the one thing I'm doing right now. And that's for the future as well, in terms of like a horizon scan, mm, I think is yeah. a good way to put it, of looking forward as to what I'm doing now, be it in terms of engagement or research, where can that then go? And it may be that yeah. I can't actually address that for a long time. Um, there's so many questions that will be associated with my own research um, past this point of my PhD. Mm. Um, yes. And same again with the actual engagement of how can I in the future put out what I have found in the past three years and having that kind of in the back of my mind ready to go forward. Yes. I think, yeah. Yes. I think that phrase horizon scanning is a really useful one to encapsulate that. So mm. thank you. Um, now, I should have said at the start of the video, and I failed to say it, so, that this video, we've planned it as uh, the first of a series of three short videos. So let's finish this video here and then we'll record the others and publicise and uh, publish them together. So for now, thank you very much. Look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you. Yes.